Hi, this is Corey Franklin with Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently, who've had a significant effect on either our history, our society, or our culture. And tonight we're going to start out with F. Sherwood Rowland. Dr. Rowland died recently at the age of 84, and he was the chemist who changed the world with his discovery. In the 1950s and 60s, chemists came up with a compound that was known as chlorofluorocarbons. And these chlorofluorocarbons were a wonder compound, and they were supposedly inert building blocks that were used in aerosol sprays of all types, hair sprays, all sorts of other sprays, deodorants, grocery freezers, and in Freon for car air conditioners and other type of coolers. They are more familiarly known to the public as CFCs. Dr. Rowland was a chemist. He was actually a great athlete also. He was six foot five, played semi-pro basketball at the University of Chicago, also played semi-pro baseball. However, he opted to go into chemistry. And in the early 1970s, along with a colleague, Mario Molina, Dr. Rowland found that CFCs would react with ultraviolet light in the stratosphere. The ultraviolet light would essentially knock a chlorine atom off the CFC the chlorine atom would break up the layer of ozone that protected the earth from ultraviolet light and by breaking up this ozone layer it essentially caused a hole in the ozone layer and the hole in the ozone layer allowed massive amounts of ultraviolet light that would normally not reach the earth to reach the earth and do damage to plants and animals. Here, courtesy of BBC4, is Jonathan Shanklin of the British Antarctic Survey Expedition explaining Dr. Rowland's work. The key thing that Rowland discovered was a, a chemical means whereby chlorine from chlorofluorocarbons, which were then being used in air conditioning systems and in aerosol spray cans, how that chlorine could interact with ozone in the atmosphere and reduce the thickness of the ozone layer. Here is Dr. Rowland himself explaining how CFCs affected the ozone layer in the environment. The chlorofluorocarbon gases are composed of three, three elements, uh, carbon, chlorine, fluorine. Uh, and that's why they get called chlorofluorocarbons. Uh, they were invented, they are not natural occurring substances, they were invented in the late 1920s uh, as substitute refrigerants. When, when, when I grew up, uh, we had an ice box, uh, which was and a man in the summer who delivered ice. And if you put the ice in the, in the box, and uh, it would be delivered every few days. And subsequently, that was replaced by a refrigerator. And uh, the refrigerator needs a fluid which can be easily converted from being a liquid to a gas and back to a liquid. Well, the early refrigerants uh, were, the, were the ones, molecules that were easily converted between liquid and gas. And they uh, had the, the, the problem that sometimes they escape and uh, they're obnoxious or worse. Uh, so they were looking for an inert material and they specifically designed the CFCs as refrigerants. And this ability to convert from a liquid to a gas is also very useful in aerosol propellant and the manufacturing of uh, foam for automobile car seats and things. Uh, so the uses grew very rapidly. Uh, and that's why, that's why the CFCs began to accumulate in the atmosphere. Well, Drs. Rowland and Molina published a paper in Nature in 1974 describing their findings, and they were met with a lot of skepticism in the scientific community for over a decade. Here is Ralph Cicerone from the National Academy of Sciences. And the very notion that an aerosol spray can could end up having a global physical impact, a worldwide impact on an important part of nature, that was a notion which had never been advanced before. Industry people immediately objected. First of all, the chemical companies that were producing the CFCs, then the products that were being packaged in aerosol spray cans, hairsprays, deodorants, and then finally the people who made the components of the package, the pressurized cans, the little plastic valves. And they, of course, ridiculed the results. They cast a lot of scorn on 
Roland and Molina. He was a very dignified man, and he did not respond in kind. But after a few years, as the science started to be tested by other scientists, the reaction then triggered a lot more research, which was all confirmatory. However, 11 years after they published their paper, British scientists discovered that indeed, in Antarctica, the stratospheric ozone layer, which protected the Earth from ultraviolet light, had developed a massive hole. Here's Dr. Shanklin again. I was a, a young graduate scientist, and one of the first things that I was given to do was start processing some of our ozone, ozone data. What I really wanted to do was to reassure people that nothing odd was happening at all, that this theory that Sherry Rowland had put forward, that spray cans and indeed Concord itself could destroy the ozone layer must be wrong. But it became clearer and clearer as the data was processed that something systematic was happening. And then in 1982, I had my first visit to the Antarctic and we installed a new ozone spectrophotometer and that gave added confidence that the data was correct. And then that really led us to systematically show that it was indeed chlorine from the CFCs that was causing the reduction in the Antarctic. And that was something that really nobody had expected. Everybody was looking elsewhere, and so finding something in the Antarctic was a real surprise. Here's the BBC. Well, we discovered that in the early spring, soon after the sun rose again after the long polar night, there was a very rapid decrease of ozone. And this has grown to the extent that it's now 50% of the ozone layer disappears in about 30 days. Their work, along with this discovery, led in 1987 to the Montreal Protocol, which was an international environmental treaty to stop the production of CFCs and other ozone-depleting chemicals and eliminate the inventories of them. Eventually, and eventually will mean a few years, so five or possibly ten, I think there will be replacements for essentially all uses of the CFCs. The easy ones, like aerosol propellants, could be gotten rid of within six months or a year because there have been 10 or 12 years of experience with substitutes. So we know exactly how to do it. They, we know the substitutes that are available. All that was necessary was for the government or somebody to put some pressure on the industries to go to the alternatives. The lifetime of these chemicals in the atmosphere is the order of a century so that the ozone hole over Antarctica is going to be there all of the 21st century. We missed a chance to ban in 1976 that would have cut down the amount and perhaps would have avoided the ozone hole that we see now. But uh, we missed that chance and now we're going to have to live with that. The problem is cutting back as quickly as possible so it doesn't get too much worse. So what Dr. Rowland did was essentially groundbreaking in eliminating the CFCs and the danger they pose to the environment. In 1995, he, Dr. Molina, and Dr. Paul Crutzen of the Max Planck Institute won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. Some final words from Jonathan Shanklin. Looking at the future, if you like, I think Sherry Rowland was optimistic that we could, by changing our behavior, make a difference by united efforts. And we are making a difference. That's the really exciting thing. The amount of those ozone-destroying substances is going down, and that's very clear in the data. I think the science community mourns the death of any great scientist who has a, a broad range of knowledge and increasingly science is very specialized and people have their own little niches. Sherry Rowland was a much more wide-ranging scientist and as such will be uh, mourned even more. It's fair to say that Dr. Rowland was one of the most important figures in science in developing the link between man-made chemicals and the environment which carries on with the work today with climate change. He was truly a unique thinker and a scientific innovator. We're going to move on now to the death of the Encyclopedia Britannica. The Chicago-based Encyclopedia Britannica company recently announced that after 244 years, they are shelving the printed edition of Encyclopedia Britannica that's so well known to so many families in favor of the web-based version, completing the digital transition and marking the end of one of the longest chapters in publishing history. Britannica was founded in 1768 in Scotland 
and they moved their headquarters to Chicago in 1935. And here is a CNN report on the end of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Encyclopedia Britannica, an iconic brand whose volumes have lined shelves of homes and libraries since it was first published 244 years ago. Yet the times have changed. People don't page through heavy books anymore. They use Google. And so, Britannica is undergoing a major transformation. It's no longer printing books. In the print, we can only fit so much content. And in the web, we have much more content than we can fit on the print. So trying to squeeze all of that content or prioritize all of that content into the print is quite a difficult uh, task and something that takes a lot of time. Our print set can no longer display or, or, or carry the quality of our online databases. And so, with the demise of the print version, the encyclopedia will now be fully digital through Britannica's website and an app for smartphones and tablets. For Britannica, it's the end of an era, but not the end of the company. Now, we've been uh, digital, uh, mostly digital for many years now. You know, we, the company started to have more digital revenues than print revenue maybe six years ago. And since then, the revenue of our online uh, services have actually has grown significantly. The majority of our company's revenue is actually from the creation and providing, actually, e-learning solutions into the classroom, into the elementary and high school market. Consumers already have access to an online competitor of sorts, Wikipedia. It's not always reliable, but it is free. Britannica will have to convince customers to pay for its reliability. Obviously, Britannica is all about scholarly knowledge that is brought to the public through an editorial process. And we want this knowledge to be available to as many people as possible. Uh, Wikipedia is different. Wikipedia is a technology that allows a lot of collaboration, and uh, in, in such a way, it actually grows uh, quite easily with a lot of facts, factoids, truths, and lies, all of them mixed together. You know, some of the articles are of great quality, some others are not. Britannica, on the other side, is smaller in scope. Uh, we can only allocate editorial resources to those things that are uh, most important for humans to know. So we uh, have a smaller database, but our database is much more reliable, much more stable. We believe that Britannica is one of those sources that you can trust. Even though the printed version is becoming a footnote in Britannica's long history, the company still feels that there is a place for the A to Z encyclopedia in an online world. So the company is growing both in revenue and staff, and this announcement doesn't have any impact whatsoever. If anything, it just allows us to be actually better at creating digital solutions for the general public. Well, the motto of Encyclopedia Britannica was, when in doubt, look it up. And for decades of Americans, especially in the generations after World War II, having Encyclopedia Britannica in your house was a marker of refinement, literacy, good taste. Uh, Encyclopedia Britannica salesmen would scour the country and they would try and sell the latest edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. It was expensive. People usually bought it on installment plans. But if you had it in your living room or in your family room, it generally indicated that you were an educated individual. I know my parents got one when I was little. We got one when uh, uh, my wife and I got married. And for many families, it was a rite of passage, as it were, into the realm of the middle class to have the Encyclopedia Britannica prominently displayed in your home. I'm going to read a little essay by Alan Massey, who wrote it in the London Daily Telegraph. Alan Massey is a Scot who has written a number of novels and books, and he wrote an essay entitled The Sad Death of the Encyclopedia Britannica. I think his piece is a fitting tribute to the Encyclopedia Britannica and what it meant to us. The old order changeth, yielding place to the new, and God fulfills himself in many ways, lest one good custom should corrupt the world. The lines from Tennyson's Mort d'Arthur seem appropriate to the news that the Encyclopedia Britannica will no longer be published in book form, but only electronically. Knowledge is, we are told, changing so fast that the printed version is quickly out of date, while it is easy to correct or amend the online one. The argument is plausible but spurious. The interpretation of what we know may shift, and new facts may sometimes be unearthed, but the bulk of knowledge endures. I would guess that the vast majority of articles in the Britannica remain authoritative, and this is indeed true of earlier editions such as the ninth, known as the Scholar's Edition, and the eleventh, the last to be published in Britain, though already American-owned. The real reason for abandoning the print edition is that it has become too expensive to produce and sales have been declining, so we've come to the end of an old song. The encyclopedia dates from the 18th century Enlightenment. In France, Diderot enlisted the services of scholars and savants 
to produce his compendium of universal knowledge, the Encyclopedia. The Britannica was almost simultaneously conceived and brought to birth in an alley called Anchor Close off the High Street of Edinburgh. Its progenitor was a printer called William Smiley, and he published it in three volumes in 1771. The idea took hold, and soon a second edition was in preparation. This was edited by the extraordinary James Titler, who wrote much of its ten volumes himself. It appeared between 1777 and 1784. He was well equipped for the huge task, being a chemist, surgeon, printer, poet, political agitator, and hack journalist who also, by way of diversion, manned the first hot air balloon ascent made in Britain in Edinburgh in 1784, perhaps to celebrate the completion of his work on the encyclopedia. Third and fourth edition soon followed, the latter expanded to 20 volumes. It was then bought by Archibald Constable, who Sir Walter Scott called the Napoleon of Publishers. Constable was responsible for the next two editions. In 1827, when he was ruined in the financial crash, which also brought Scott down, he sold it to A and C Black, who continued to publish it in Scotland till they removed their headquarters to London. Black sold it to American Interests, and the first edition published in the United States appeared in 1921. Before then, the American owners had embarked on the practice of door-to-door -door selling, a dispiriting task often undertaken by poor students and impoverished graduates. I've never owned a set of Britannica, though I should have liked to have one of the 11th edition, over which I poured for many hours in my school library more than half a century ago. The leather binding spoke of authority. The print was beautifully clear, and the articles as lucid and elegant as they were informative. Even today, I suppose that many of the historical ones retain their value. The scientific ones will be out of date, of course, yet still interesting and useful as evidence of the best that was known when they were written. It's sad to think there will be no more of these volumes, but that's the way the world is going, and fewer and fewer works of reference will appear in hard copy. A and C Black, the former proprietors of the Britannica, now invite people to update their who's who entry online, and probably most people who consult the latest revision of the Dictionary of National Biography probably do so on the screen. That was Massey's lament for the Encyclopedia Britannica. I'm proud to say that I still own an edition, and I plan on keeping it for as long as possible and handing it down to my children. We're going to say goodbye to the print edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. We will miss it sorely. Well, I want to thank my producer, Sid Tapps, and tonight we're going to go out with a song about a young man who needs an encyclopedia. The song was originally written by Sam Cooke along with Lou Adler. There's Lou Adler's name coming up again. And Herb Alpert, who once closed for us. Sam Cooke did a memorable version of this song. Herman's Hermans did it. Art Garfunkel, Paul Simon, and James Taylor did it. But tonight, the love-struck young man who needs the encyclopedia is none other than Otis Redding. Here is Wonderful World. I don't know much about my history, man. Don't know much about my biology. Don't know much about the science book. Don't know what a sliding rule is for. But I do know what it's for.